Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is episode 159. Today's guest is a veteran actor. You know him from Friends, ER, The Nanny, Conan, Shameless. And of course, he played Larry, the owner of Monks, in six Seinfeld episodes. Please welcome Lawrence Mandley. Lawrence, thanks for joining. Hi, guys. Thank you for inviting me. Lawrence, big treat for us. So take us back. Believe it or not, it's been 30 years since the outing aired. Uh, February of 93. I know. I know. I know. Everything was still dark back then. Oh, man, you look great. And, you know, what an episode. The outing of season four, literally the peak of Seinfeld. But uh, tell us a little bit about, obviously, your background, but how, how that role came about. Obviously, that was a little bit into season four, but 1993. Um, mm. Audition process. Give us a little background how you got how you landed a role on Seinfeld. Well, actually, I had gone in previously to audition for a role of a cop. Um, I don't even remember which episode it was. It was just a cop. And if I had gotten that one, I, I would have been in and out, never heard from again. Uh, but for this one, I remember going in and reading it. And there were people who were going in, who went in ahead of me and I could hear them outside. And everybody was just like very big, very, very big you know, about, you know, uh, what the line was. You boys going to get out of here. All of that nonsense. And I didn't see it that way. I didn't I didn't see it that way at all. I thought that it should be very intimate. I should get right up on them. I need to speak very softly and clearly so that they knew they can't do that anymore. <laughs> so what I did in the office was I was standing there and there was a chair right next to the desk. So I um, remember going in and I leaned on the chair and said, if you boys can't behave yourselves. And then I sat down that I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Next thing I knew, I got the gig. Such a good line. Yep. So memorable the way you, you deliver that line. We were talking about right before you came on. Every time we, we we love it. We laugh every time. So that's it. You nailed it right there. Nailed it right there. I mean, and and it's one of the few auditions that they didn't have me. Well, let's try this. Let's try this. They just thank you. And then I left. And next thing I knew, I got it. That was it. Was was Jerry or Larry in the room? Do you remember? No, neither of them were. Just Hirschfeld? Oh. It was it was it was the casting director, whoever the cast director director was at the time. I don't remember, honestly. Uh, Jerry never saw me until we actually did the scene. Uh, same thing with Jason. They 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 had no inkling. As a matter of fact, when I was uh, standing there before I ma actually made my entrance, uh, the extra co coordinator thought I was an extra, and he's trying to get me out of the scene. I said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, and then I went to do the scene. Uh, and then they just they just reacted to it. And it was yeah, it's such a it's such a good scene, and, and it's it's so delivered so perfectly. And like like Chris said, it, it it's in the outing, which is obviously one of, one of the most talked about episodes of Seinfeld, especially when it aired back then mm -hmm. in season four. It was one of the launch pad episodes, probably that in the contest uh, during that season. Um, and then you come back, right? So tell us tell us about the second time. Now we got season five, the wife. Where you come back, how soon did you know that you kind of might be recurring or, or was it just like they just came back to you like like from season five started or do they maybe say after that episode, like, hey, we might need you again. Like, tell us about the recurring aspect just for your second episode. Truth be told, I thought I was gone because between my two episodes, remember, they had the episode with the guy who's, whose daughters were the waitresses. Yes. Yeah. yeah so just talking about that. that. Yeah, I thought I was gone. I thought, I, and I saw that episode, and I thought, well, okay, so much for that. Uh, and the next thing I knew, they called me in, and I even asked them, well, what, what happened to the guy with the big-breasted daughters? And then hey, it didn't work. So they, so I came in, and it was basically the same, the same thing. I just, and he, Jerry said to me, I said, he said, deliver it as close to. You can the closest you can to how you did before. And I said, okay. Okay. So I, 
It, it's again, that's very calm, very quiet, and very threatening. I think. Yeah, with the uh, with the syrup, the uh, syrup. We, yeah. no we don't allow any outside syrups. Or I, yeah. I can't pronounce the way you said syrup, but um, man, you nailed it. And obviously, you were there with with uh, you know an up and comer, Courtney Cox. And we all know Absolutely. what kind of she went on to. That must that must have been pretty cool. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, when I did uh, my Friends episode. I came up to her and said, you know, we worked together before. And she said, yeah, I know. I remember Seinfeld. <laughs> so, yeah, but yes, I did. But that was before our friends had uh, come on. Right. Now, what is your take on outside syrup? As a, if I was an owner, I'd say bring it in, right? Like, you're not going to waste your product, but you, uh, I guess you stand by the monk's product there. Well, now... <clears throat> Now, Larry on the show <laughs> against it. This Larry has been known to bring his own syrup into places. Because <laughs> uh, I grew up in Chicago, and there's a brand of syrup in Chicago called Alaga. And you can't get Alaga out here on the West Coast. But I loved Alaga because it reminded me of Sunday mornings when my mom would fix pancakes for my brother and me. And I have been known to bring small containers of Alaga to the to the restaurant with me. So. That's a, that's fantastic. So it's, it sounds like you were a fan of the show, meaning you know you mentioned the guy with the daughters, the whole thing. So mm-hmm. um, were you were you a fan of the show? I know you you tried out in earlier seasons. You said, but you were kind of a follower of, of the program. You kind of knew what you were stepping into. After I did the first one, I started watching the show. And that, that's just being very honest. You know, I, I would catch it periodically, but I didn't really become a fan fan until uh, after I had done that first one. Then after I did that first one, I kind of got hooked. So. Yeah, you you and, and you and a lot of other people, really. Right. Mm. Um, and by that point, I'm sure now you've done the two. Um, it's interesting because I was rewatching, um, you know, your your third appearance in uh, in the soup in season six. So now it's mm-hmm. four, five, six. You're back again in that episode. It looks like maybe you could tell us, but there's the scene where they're doing the schmoopy schmoopy in the booths and you're in the background and it looks like you're walking over to say something, maybe to yell at them for doing PDA, mm-hmm. maybe that same kind of delivery, but it gets maybe it gets cut. Uh, okay, yeah. Tell us about that then. That missing scene that we'd love to maybe hear the background on that. Um, I re- I I honestly don't remember what the actual line was, uh, but I I do remember that we did it and then they moved on. And I wanted to try another take. Uh, I had an idea that I wanted to try, but they but they were in a hurry so that they moved on because I wanted to come over to the table. And lean down and ask them, is there nowhere else that you two can go? <laughs> um, but that didn't happen. You know, and, and it would work because that was the soup Nazi episode, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but I, iconic, go. iconic episode for sure. Um, mm-hmm. What do you, I, I mean, you had that, I, I, don't, I guess we can call it a fatherly presence to these children, if you will. I think that's what you conveyed, whether it was, you know, you boys can't control yourselves to, you know, the whole syrup thing to then just staring at Schmoopy. I guess, was there any other, it sounds like you just, you understood this man, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you understood these, you know, (laughs) we can call them children, Jerry, George, Kramer, Lane. Um, Was there any direction? And we'll get into some of the directors because you kind of, you worked with, Sharonis and Ackerman, but was there any direction, I guess, from, yeah, from the directors or even Larry David himself on, on how you were portrayed? Um, interestingly, uh, how you just described how I uh, interacted with them, Jason once commented on that, and he said, it's like you have been through an awful lot in your life. And you were trying so hard, so hard to keep it together and under control. And then these these idiots come in and you have to just kind of take a deep breath. That's it. Okay. And then proceed from there, which actually kind of worked for me. Um, 
Larry gave me a direction once, and that's an interesting direction, because there was a scene where we had run through it. I'm on the phone, and then I go to the table to talk to them. I slam the phone down, and I go to the table and talk to them and tell them, you know, you, you need to tell your friend George or whatever the line was. Well, we ran through it, and there were no extras in it, but then all of a sudden the extras came in, and I had difficulty getting from the phone to the table. So I was, so letters, you were late. I said, yeah, I know. I had, I had to maneuver my way around extras. He said, handle it. And that was his direction. Handle it. So that's what I did. Yeah, I like that. I mean, it sounds like from what we've heard from other guest stars that, uh, you know, Larry was pretty much the show runner, obviously, even if there was a director, whether it was Ackerman or Sharon's Sharonis and, um, you know, coming from, you know, he knew what he wanted and he knew how to, you know, get it out, out of, out of, uh, you know, the script and, and the actors, because, you know, that one vision of Larry is obviously the through line of the show. Jerry, obviously two, you know, co-creators, but mm -hmm. it was really Larry's voice. I think if you will, for, for a lot of it, um, and, and, you know, we touched on your, your, the Audi was season four, the wife was season five, season six soup you just mentioned where you wanted to make George your personal hand puppet. Uh, yeah, the soup yeah, Nazi yeah. was season seven, which we touched on. Um, then you come back for season eight and there is no Larry David there. Right. So that's the foundation episode when, uh, when Jerry's quizzing all of the um, waitresses on the best, uh, you know, the best story to tell about being, uh, you know, a single guy that didn't get married and you're there again, getting upset at them, you know, ruining your, ruining your day and your staff. But, you know, just from a, a set perspective, you know, not having Larry there um, first episode of season seven without Larry, did you, you know, what can you tell us about the vibe on Sam? You'd been there now, you know, four or five times. So I'm, I'm sure you have a take on that. I have to tell you for my own personal reasons, that was my favorite episode. Why that was the case was I was not there when they actually shot the episode. Uh, I had gone, I had gone on a cruise. I had, I was out in the middle. I was out in the middle of the Caribbean on a cruise and I had signed out with my agent and all that and, and let everybody know. However, the agent that I signed, that I signed out with did not let anybody know. So I come back to LA and I've got all of these messages from my agent, from the Seinfeld, from production, and the people, and I started well, trying to find you and it kept growing in intensity about, you know, well, where are you? Where are you? And then they got really concerned. Finally, somebody in my, at, somebody at my agency had the sense to call my sister, who was a casting director at the time, and said, well, he's on a cruise in the Caribbean. So, <laughs> found, so fine, got everything all squared away, found out that I did indeed call in, so I didn't do anything wrong. What they did was they called me in the next week while they were filming another episode and then we just sat there at the table we shot that scene and we were out of there so i didn't deal with larry or the, or, or anybody it was just the, the bunch of us i can't honestly i don't remember which director it was and we just we just did it and we're out and and i tell people to this day you know i jerry seinfeld was all right with me because they didn't have to do that they could have just written that scene out but they didn't do that it yeah, that, that's a great point. And that just that takes us back to kind of the unselfishness of these guys and mm -hmm. and just knowing how you fit. I mean, incredible stuff. Um, so, Larry, just take uh, go back a little bit. You, you mentioned you're a Chicago guy. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about first off, I mean. We know the Chicago guys, they're all over Seinfeld, whether it's, uh, you know, Second City, uh, Groundlings, all that stuff. I mean, funny, funny and funny in Chicago go hand in hand. But how did you, Chicago guy, end up for not only on the set of Seinfeld, but what a career you've had in acting? How did you get that acting bug? Did, did you know right away? I've, I've known for a while. I've known since I was a kid that I wanted to pursue it. I did not necessarily know what phase of entertainment I wanted to be in. Um, when I was 14 years old, uh, I went to what was then the theater, the Regal Theater 
on the south side of Chicago. That's where they used to have all of the old Motown reviews and all of those people came to see. Uh, and I, I went there and the first act I saw was Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, which I fell in love with. The next time I went to the Regal, the Temptations were the headliners. I saw those five tall guys up on that stage and that was it. That was it. I said, in some way, shape, or form, I am doing this. And I knew that, that, that that's what I wanted. And I tried for years just to get a group together. Uh, a group, I used to call it the group that just did not want to be formed. And I formed groups in Chicago. When I first came out here, I formed a couple of groups, but they didn't stick. But in the meantime, I always knew that even if I got my group together, somewhere down the line, I wanted to go into acting. So I started taking classes. I took I took workshops and I started studying uh, and just bit by bit. And then for the longest time, you know, nothing happened at all. But then the ball started rolling and I started getting gigs. Um, I got a gig on. I think my very first gig was on an episode of Benson. Uh, and then then I did then I did an episode of um, of Hill Street Blues. Uh, I did a couple of Hill Street Blues, as a matter of fact. Uh, and then, but bit by bit by bit by bit by bit by bit by bit, things started to happen. And I just started, the singing just took a back seat. And now I did, I've done a couple of musicals and that's fine, but it's still in, that's still in the rear seat. This is what I do. The acting is, is, is what I do. And, wow. and yeah, I, but, so I started off wanting to be a singer and it, and it, and it gravitated to this. So. Awesome. So Southside guy, you got you're your White Sox uh, fan? I am a White Sox fan. As a matter of fact, I was an Andy Frayne usher for one whole day uh, at White Sox Park, and they stationed me out in the parking lot. I never saw a minute of the game. <laughs> <laughs> so so Good much stuff. for White Sox. Well, yeah, you, you finally got your World Series a few years ago, right? So there you yeah. go. <laughs> um. Well, it's funny you mentioned Benson. Obviously, uh, I don't know if Jerry was on Benson. Jeff Seinfeld was on Benson at that time, but um, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. No, I mean, so you know, clearly you you earned your stripes, and so yeah. Back to Seinfeld, you mentioned um, the foundation was your favorite episode. What I guess when people stop you in the street, what's what what do you most recognize from Seinfeld fans? Is it the "If you boys can't control yourselves"? Is it the George Hand puppet? What do what do people think about when they see you sir. Uh, from a Seinfeld perspective? It's it's the sir. Usually the it's syrup. the sir. <laughs> the syrup's the funniest line, I think, just because it's a funny like because it's syrups, jams, or condiments. It's just an uh, it's just the jams thrown in there. The syrups. <laughs> I think that's the funniest line. Uh, I, I think you're. I think the. Uh, the original your your first line of uh, you boys can't control yourselves is is to me the most memorable but i think the other ones are funny but they're all great and and it's 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 funny that um you know we were talking about it before before you came on me and chris uh it feels like you're in more than six episodes like the seinfeld fans you're like always there like you're you're there you know and we, we just know you as as larry the owner of monks but you know you know, you're credited and you're in six episodes, but it just seems like you're more of the fabric of the show than that. And especially because you span so many seasons, you're in so many big episodes. I mean, the outing, the outing, the soup Nazi, uh, you know, the wife, th these are episodes that people remember a lot. Uh, and so, you know, that, that, that goes a long way with the Seinfeld fandom. Uh, what is, what can you tell us from those kind of, you know, you're there six times, right? Um, Mm -hmm. What's like your your most memorable or funniest maybe uh, on or off set interaction, preferably with one of the main four, but maybe not. Maybe just there. Just you know, you probably saw a lot in, in the in the six different times you were down there on set. You know, working with those guys. I don't know if if you ever crossed paths with them. You know, uh, craft table things like that. Just kind of like any any story there that you you, you could share with our fans. Um, maybe not not necessarily on on, on the set, uh, but. I remember once years ago when I, I used to live in I used to live in Sherman Oaks and I was on my way somewhere and I stopped into a 7 Eleven to get a coffee and Jason was in there. And and he and I just stopped and, and shot the breeze for a little while. Um and 
his back was to me at first. And I just said, hey, Jason, how you doing? And he turned the way he would just to a fan and then saw it was me. And it was like, oh, hey. And we just and we just tried, you know, talk for a while. Then I mean, there was um, his sister was having medical problems at the time. And I remember we talked about that. Uh, and he was just. The thing that I remember, not just about him, but about all of them, was that he was just they were just very nice, very warm, very nice people and very warm and very open to me. You know, years, years, years later, when uh, Michael had his problem, uh, people were coming up to me and asking, did you see that? I said, I never saw any of that. I never saw a moment of that. I mean, I'm, a sur- I'm as surprised as everybody else. So, but yeah, but they were always, they were always, always very nice to me. And I appreciate that beyond belief because I have been on sets where that has not always been the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've yeah. heard that. Uh, was that Pat Morita on O'Hara or who? who was, oh uh, my God. How do you know about that? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of Seinfeld alums uh, are, well, my last name's O'Hara, but uh, so I always kind of fo- followed that show back in the day. It was on, on ABC, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, not not that Come is on. the only show that I ever did that I ever did where nobody, nobody, the star included, Pat Marie England, nobody wanted to be there. It was just everybody was miserable. Everybody was just in the dumps all the time, and they were snarly and it was surly. Nobody wanted to be there, and and I made a faux pas. I was on the set and I ran into, and I, I won't say who it was, but I ran into an actor who I used to watch as a kid. You know, all those shows that used to be on Warner Brothers, like Maverick and 77 Sunset Strip and, and all of those shows. Mm-hmm. You know, I ran into an actor who was a star of one of those shows. And I came up to him and I told him I was a fan of his and how much I admired his work. And he was really kind of standoffish, like he didn't want to be bothered. So, And I could sense that he didn't want to talk. So I just backed up and said, I just want to tell you that. And thank you for talking to me. And let him go. And I found out later on that he was there working as an extra. And, and, and he just didn't want to be recognized. Uh, that was not. That was not a happy set. That was not a happy set. <laughs> but what I did now, as now I did not realize this until later on, but um, I can't think of his name. Kevin, who was the voice of Batman, was was also on that show. I had no recollection of that until just recently when he passed away and they were listing his credits. I'm like, oh, my God, I met Batman and didn't even know it. <laughs> Oh man. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, what, what a career. Um, and obviously, you know, you made your, you made your mark with Seinfeld for sure. We, the, the final episode, I don't think we, we touched on yet again, uh, a few other stars that went on to bigger and brighter things like Bob Oden, Odenkirk, mm-hmm. um, was in that episode. And I think that's actually the first time we hear your name. That's Kramer finally goes, come on, Larry, you know me when you're, when you're kicking yeah. him out for smoking. Yeah, they gave him my name. Yeah. And they used your real name, which was cool, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and then obviously you taking flowers uh, from Elaine. Mm-hmm. And when I, th- you know, when I think about all these episodes, it's hard not to think about uh, Ruthie Cohen, who was the cashier at Monks, if you yeah, will. Um, Very nice lady. Yeah, tell us about her. I mean, yeah, yeah, so when we think about Monks, we think about you and Ruthie, you know, was there, uh, was she as sweet as sweet as it seemed? Sweet as sugar. Sweet as she, one. Very, she was kind of soft spoken, but she was very always smiling, always very warm, very open, very, very, very nice woman. You know, and there were a couple. There were a couple of episodes. Uh, I think the hand puppet one. I started my thing right next to her, so we stood there and we just just chitty chatted for a moment. Just again, just a very, very, very nice woman. That's great to hear because she she's definitely a fan favorite too as well. Like Chris mentioned, you think of Monks, you think of her, you think of you, and uh, that's great to hear that that she was that sweet. Um, six six episodes, uh, you know, four, five, six, seven, oh, five different seasons. Any you go to any of the rap parties for any of these seasons at all? I Do you did. remember? 
I yeah, did. Got any, any stories you, you can share with us from any of those parties? Well, that you no, might... no, 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 nothing outstanding, nothing outlandish. I you know. I wish I did have a story, but I just, <laughs> you know, I, I took my ditch. We had a wonderful time. The band was playing, and the band it was it was the the band that you hear playing the theme played at the rap parties. So and and they and they played and they sounded wonderful. And I just with my lady friend, we just. Had a good time. Nice, nice. And then um, I, I had another question. You mentioned, you know, Larry David uh, had given you that one direction and and, and, you, and Jerry, even in, the, in your first scene, kind of said, in your second scene, said, you know, do what you did last time. We loved it kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. Anything with any of the writers? Because a lot of your episodes are written by some of the big name writers from the show, like Larry Charles, Peter Melman, uh, even Spike Ferriston and Alec Berg and, and Schaefer. They went on to, to big, bigger and better things as well. Um, sometimes the writers get involved. Sometimes they don't. Just curious if, if you had any interaction with with any of those any no. of those writers or the rest never, of it. Yeah, never, never did. Never did. It depends. So, sometimes the writers do get involved in certain episodes, and and sometimes they don't. But yeah. what's uh, I, I you know your story about the cruise? I mean, what can you say? Jerry Seinfeld rarely waits for anybody, but he waited for you. So and, that's and, gotta, from, and from what I understand, it was his decision. So this is why I say, you know, Jerry Seinfeld is all right with me. <laughs> and those residuals too, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> so I, so I would so you mentioned yeah you mentioned the foundation and that, that's a great story for we'll, we'll put that aside that that episode okay. uh, for be, for being your favorite because obviously there's a personal story there but um what episode's your favorite to watch? Oh Adam, again the, the, again the syrup. Yeah, it's done, huh? The wife. Yeah, done. And and the reason why, if you guys can't tell, we did maybe, we did three takes. And you can't see him because of the camera angle, but Jerry is laughing the entire time during all three takes. And I'm trying, and I'm trying to be mean and surly and, and don't you do this. And I'm looking at him laughing at me. So I had to get through this while, while, while that was going on. But, and, and I just... Like the way that it came out, I just loved the way that it played. The final scene played out, and I loved that I made him laugh. If you can, if you can make a comedian laugh, you're doing okay. Yeah, that, yeah. That that was a fun episode with a lot of guest stars. So typical week. Are you are you there? You meet like you know uh, what's it? The, the Seinfeld parents were on that episode. Mm-hmm. You know Barney Martin and and Liz Sheridan, obviously Courtney Cox, uh, a bunch of others, Uncle Leo, like. Did you interact with any of these other guest stars? I, or did. Share stars? I did, particularly uh, Barney and Uncle Leo, because when I was a little kid, Uncle Leo, everything that I ever saw him in, he was like the bad guy. He he, he spent his career being the bad guy. And so <laughs> th- this is how I knew him. Len, I think his name was. He was he was the bad guy. So when he became so when he became Uncle Leo, it came, it he went from you know, holding the gun up at you and going, all right, give me a dough, To Hello, Jerry. It was, I loved Uncle Leo. I loved Uncle Leo. And I, t- and I told him that everything I ever saw you when I was a little kid, you were the bad guy. I love this guy. And he, and he loved that. And Barney, um, Barney, uh, I'm uh, from, 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 from Arthur, um, from one of the old Mel Brooks movies. I, I I can't even remember which one. But Barney's been around forever, too. He's another one who I watched when I was a kid. You know, um, and that that was a kick for me, not just with these two, but anytime I did a gig and somebody was on the show whom I watched when I was coming up was always was always was always a big thrill for me. Yeah, I think about that. It's a very good point you brought up because I think what Seinfeld did in that respect, I think Larry and Jerry both, and and you know to a degree probably the writing staff, but I think Larry and Jerry, they must have just like you, I'm, I'm you know grew up with these guys and 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 almost hand picked them to to kind of you know introduce a whole new generation to, to guys like Jerry Stiller and, and Barney, like you just mentioned, sure. and, and Uncle Leo, like Len Les- Lesser. Like Man, that's my generation that's- didn't know these guys as you as your generation did. And then we get to see them and Jerry and Larry kind of introduced them to, to this whole new generation, a whole new light. And, uh, you know, that, that is a great point and kind of fun to see how 
um, you know, you got to work with some of these guys that, that you admired, and then we got to kind of see them in, 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 for the first time. And and Jerry really brought, I would guess, I mean, you might know more if you spoke, like, did it kind of revitalize their careers? I'm guessing too, right? As far as I'm that sure goes. Did. So these- I'm sure. Did. And, and uh, Len, you, I mean, if you didn't, if you never saw him, you have to believe me. When Len was the bad guy, he was sinister. He was, he was not joking. He was sinister. And then he comes back and he's Uncle Leo and he's this big pussycat. It's what it was wonderful. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a testament to just great acting, right? I mean, mm-hmm. up and down the board, this show had great acting and for sure the the, the casting was just perfect, right? I mean, from from Jerry mm-hmm. on down to to you on six episodes. Like Tony mentioned, we thought you were there the whole time. Like that's, I mean, that that's the impact you had. So I appreciate that. I, I really do appreciate it. There were a couple of episodes that I was initially in that they uh, that I was written out of. Um, one of them was, there was an episode where George was trying to go around and find all, and, and, and find all the black people that he knew. And yes. I was, and I was initially in that episode. Uh, but for whatever reason, it ran long, so I was written out. And then the the season finale, I was supposed to be in that one. Really? Oh yeah. man! Wait, so did so they called you? Did you show up at all? Did they film no, anything? No, no, no. I, I, I was I was initially in the script, but then they but they wrote me out, so I ne- I never actually had to go. They just wrote me out of the script. Yeah. Oh man, because you you would be a good because you every single they they screwed you almost every single episode, right? I mean, that's what that was. You were testified against them, and you know they pretty much uh, there wasn't an episode that went by where they weren't uh, screwing you in some way. So that would have been a perfect, uh, you know, you would have been perfect on the stand against them. But uh, that, well, that that yeah, it wasn't meant to be. So yeah, I mean, listen. You left us always wanting more. And what more can you say for for an actor? So, Lawrence, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for for spending some time and telling us all these great Seinfeld stories. We can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. This has been a blast. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks, Larry. And hey, happy birthday this week, my man. Oh, yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. (laughs) I appreciate that. You remembered. (laughs) (laughs) Looking great. All right, man. Take care. Thank you, Lawrence. Have a good night. All right.